We welcome you to today's webinar titled, Not Legal, Not Natural, Not Safe, Understanding K2 in Bath Salts. This is the first in a series of two free webinars Gateway Foundation is offering in April to help you stay informed about the mental and physical health risks associated with substance abuse. As the largest provider of substance abuse treatment in Illinois, we have 11 locations throughout the state, including our newest outpatient treatment center in Chicago's River North uh, neighborhood, which will actually open on April 15th. Throughout our network of centers, Gateway offers intensive outpatient, residential, and day treatment programs for both adults and adolescents. Before we get started with the training, I'd like to briefly run through a few housekeeping items. First, a quick review of the GoToWebinar controls. As you can see here, the controls appear on the right side of your screen. The orange arrow lets you show or hide the toolbar. The hand icon lets you participate throughout the presentation. At certain points, the trainer may ask questions, and you can click this icon to participate. And there is also a question box where you can type in your question at any time during the presentation. Today's webinar will be conducted in listen-only mode to minimize any distractions or background noise. So to confirm everyone's audio is working, if you could please raise your hand uh, by clicking on the hand icon on the web uh, toolbar. Give people a few minutes to do that. OK, great. It uh, looks like we have a large group ready to get started. So the duration of this Understanding K2 and Bad Salt webinar is one hour, so all the material will be covered by shortly after 1.30. There will also be a question and answer session um, at the end, in which time uh, Dr. Otino will answer questions submitted by the participants during the webinar. Once again, you can submit a question at any time during the presentation, and we will address as many as possible at the end. Dr. Otino may also periodically ask poll questions. The poll questions will appear on the screen in place of the presentation, and we ask for your participation by selecting an answer and hitting the Submit button. Finally, at the conclusion of the webinar, we ask that you complete a brief survey to provide feedback about today's webinar. As a quick note for those of you looking to receive a CEU for today's presentation, in order to receive one CEU, you must access the webinar for one hour or more today. And this is an important note. If you have a group of people in the room, only the person who registered and logged into today's presentation will be provided the CEU. And those CEU certificates will be delivered within three weeks of today's presentation. At this time, I'd like to introduce our trainer, Dr. Brittany Otino. In her current position as clinical psychologist and program director at Gateway Foundation Springfield, Dr. Otino oversees clinical services and psychiatric referrals for the 102-bed residential treatment center and also develops and implements new training programs for clinicians. She has extensive experience with complex clinical cases for both adolescents and adults, including administering evidence-based treatment for individuals with co-occurring disorder and those who have abused synthetic drugs, K2, and bath salts. Dr. Otino is a graduate of the Illinois School of Professional Psychology and completed a doctoral training rotation at the Great Lakes Naval Hospital, which is now part of the Captain James A. Lovell Federal Health Care Center. At this time, I will turn the presentation over to your trainer, Dr. Brittany Otino. We hope you enjoy the training. Thank you, Matt. Good afternoon. We'll be spending the next hour talking about K2 and synthetic substances. As we go through this, please be mindful that questions will be answered at the end of the seminar. All right, so here we go. Um, first of all, what I'd like to do is get a little bit of information about the audience. So there's a poll question here so that we can figure out how to best frame the entire presentation. If you could respond to whether or not your primary substance abuse, mental health, medical, educational, or legal provider at this time, I would appreciate it. And we'll give just a moment for the responses to come in there.
Okay, so it looks like we've got a pretty nice spread of audience members, some of which are substance abuse, some primary mental health and legal, um, as well as a few medical and educational providers. Again, what I'd like to do is have you answer one more question, and that is what is your primary goal in attending today's webinar? My basis for this is we have a lot of information about K2 and synthetic substances. We also have a lot of different things that we can talk about in such a short amount of time. So I really would like to know where we need to spend most of our focus, and I'll try to tailor today's presentation to the specific needs of those who are here. Okay. Um, so it looks like we have a lot of individuals who are looking to gain a better understanding of the K2 and syn synthetic substances while also looking to obtain more information about current literature and to uh, better identify and treat those with those substances. Um, and who's ever trying to avoid lunch with their coworker, I hope that goes well for you. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started then. And like I said, I'll spend a lot of time talking about K2, what is it, and give a better understanding. But then I also want to place an emphasis on the treatment and um, updated information that we have available. So here's an overview of what we'll, we will learn today. One of the things I want to point out is that I personally will not read through every PowerPoint presentation slide. Um, I'm confident that at the point you're at in your professional careers, you can do that. So I will supplement the slides with additional information or case examples, um, but I won't read just directly through those as we go along. So please make sure that you're reviewing that information as well. All right, so today we'll be talking about the K2 synthetic substances as well as bath salts, talking about where they come from, the availability, signs, symptoms, um, long-term use and withdrawal, which will be something new. Um, I did this presentation last fall, and we didn't have a lot of information about long-term use or withdrawal. Again, there's not a lot of formal research on those items, um, so a lot of it will be anecdotal as well as research we've done here at our sites in treating individuals who come in reporting use of these substances. Um, we will also do a question and answer session after 1.30, and you'll have uh, opportunities to get additional resource information as well. Okay, so what we'll start with today is what are synthetic drugs? Um, basically, K2 has kind of emerged as the generic term for synthetic marijuana. Additionally, it was initially kind of touted as a specific brand of synthetic marijuana. Um, synthetic substances have been around for a long time, and just to give a little bit of history of that, for over 50 years, pharmaceutical companies have been experimenting with synthetic marijuana, basically looking to develop a chemical that would have medicinal properties um, in terms of analgesic properties, anti-inflammatory, and anti-nausea in the way that marijuana has, um, but without the psychotropic side effects that marijuana has. So what has happened is individuals have been able to uh, purchase research-grade THC, essentially, and then they distribute that, and they take those chemical components, and what they do is they dilute it with something that can be sprayed onto a leaf or a plant substance. Um, so the case synthetics basically come from research, um, research that was initiated to try to help people and to try to develop something medicinal that would be um, comparable to marijuana but without the side effects. And instead, what they've done is they have kind of twisted the market on it. And um, like I said, distributors buy and purchase that research-grade chemical. Typically, it's overseas that they're doing that. And then they dilute it. Sometimes it's with acetone, sometimes with alcohol. And other times, we're not really sure what they're using, which is one of the things that makes this chemical dangerous. Um, again, we'll go through some of the other harmful um, disadvantages of a substance that's not monitored by an FDA or a regulating agency as well. Okay, so K2 can be used um, with several different chemical compounds that come up. A lot of what you hear about is the JWH18. There's also other ones. Again, they're simical, similar in structure to a THC um, in the way that it responds to the cannabinoid receptors, but what's different about the synthetic substances is that they bind much more tightly. In doing that, what happens is it becomes uh, more effective as a stronger response. Several different types of synthetic marijuana that are sold. Um, a lot of times they're marketed as herbal incense or herbal blend. Sometimes it's potpourri. Um, and here are some of the names of ones that come up. We've heard of there's over hundreds of varieties of these that can be on the market today. So there's just a couple of samples. You can also see what it looks like there, and it does very much look just like an herbal um, 
potpourri type substance, um, it's not all that different than if you went into a Michaels or a Jeffrey Allen's and you might have looked at um, a fake pre-potted plant that you would see something like this in the bottom of it. Um, and so it's not all that different in that sense. Availability of this substance. This is going to... Right, sounds like we've got somebody in the background who's not muted. All right, we'll go ahead and continue with the availability. Um, in the past, these products were legally purchased when they initially came out, and so you could purchase them at head shops, gas stations, um, over the Internet, which continues to be a source for some people. Um, the chemical spray itself could be purchased a lot of times online through other countries such as China. Um, what the federal government, governments here in Illinois have done is they've put out several different laws to make the substances illegal. Um, what happened initially is the laws couldn't keep up with the changes in the chemical component. So there was like K2, they would change one chemical component marketed as K3, so therefore that K3 was not illegal, but K2 was. Um, they've changed some of the laws, and we'll talk about that later on today in terms of how they're trying to stay up on it, but there have been a lot of uh, responses within the Illinois legislature who have really taken this on um, because of the dangerous impact that it can have. Just for um, interest sake, it's not really a teaching component, but what do you think the sellers of synthetic drugs have reported their daily profits reaching or monthly? Open this up as a web poll if everybody can respond to that. I don't know. They need to fix it. Okay, so 41%, 42%, looks like most people are saying an average sale of two to 4000 daily. It's actually profits reaching up to $12,000 a day. Uh, so that is a significant market, which helps to explain why it was so available, because people were making tens of thousands of dollars off of this monthly. Now, again, that would have been on the extreme end of it, profits reaching that. The average probably would have been more than two to 4000 daily, but it has been reported up to $12,000 daily in sales. Okay, so according to um, the research that we've had with some of our clients who have been admitted reporting use of K2, a lot of different things came up. One of which was that although it's marketed as synthetic marijuana and initially was marketed as a legal product, a lot of people thought it was basically the same thing, but that they could get away with it. We had a lot of clients report that they used it because probation couldn't drop them for it and that they couldn't get in trouble. Um, here's what we found out, though, is that it's really nothing like marijuana. Um, very rarely did we get reports from clients stating that it had a similar high to marijuana. And on those rare occasions, it was typically somebody who used um, a very small quantity, and they didn't use it very often because oftentimes they would report a headache afterwards. Um, so we'll talk about the differences here shortly. Another thing that we showed um, in our research is that a lot of adults reported getting education from their peers about how to use it, whereas adolescents would frequently state that they used it just like marijuana, whether it was smoking a bowl, whether it was using a bong. Um, whatever that method may have been, they tried to use the same quantity and method, and typically it had significant problems. For example, we had a 13-year-old who was admitted who um, was from a rural Illinois community who reported that he and several of his friends had used K2. They had smoked it in the same manner as they had previously smoked marijuana. He said that one of their friends began the seizure, um, and they basically freaked out, and all of the friends left. The child's mother came back and found her son dead. Um, so again, the difference between the adults and the teenagers seems to be a lot of difference in terms of the education on how do we use this substance. So adults reported that their friends would say, you can't use as much. You need to start with a small um, a quantity and then see what happens before you use something else. Adults also reported that their friends might tell them, you know, what brands to use for what type of high, um, and kids just bought whatever was available. Okay, um, here are some of the reports of what we have found, again, working with our clients, both adolescents and younger adult males, um, as well as females. We've not really had any reports from uh, middle aged or older adults on using this, um, but typically what we found is, one of the differences that they liked about it was that K2 could induce a limitless high, 
they would report that with marijuana, no matter how much you smoke, at some point you kind of top out. Um, with K2, they said that doesn't happen. The more you smoke, it's like the higher and higher, which is what was part of the deal for a lot of individuals. The agitation and aggression in large quantities or depending on which package they bought, a lot of clients who previously did not have reports of aggressive behavior stated that they had become highly aggressive. Um, parents would drop off children saying, I don't know what my son's using, I don't know what they've been doing. They've started acting out, they've tried hitting us, they throw things at home, they're acting out at school, and this is new. Um, upon evaluation, we typically would find out it coincided shortly to the same time as the K2 or um, synthetic marijuana use. Another unique symptom of the K2 use is in this darker, scary thoughts, and that's how clients labeled it. And it's interesting because I've had several of them make that same report using those same adjectives. Um, they'll say that they will be high, and sometimes even a day afterwards, they will feel these dark thoughts. They'll say they wake up and they just feel dark. Um, additionally, they would talk about having scary thoughts. For example, one client reported that he had been at a hotel with some friends. He went out on the balcony after using, and he said that it was just this darkness coming over him that he knew if he did not go back into the hotel room, he would have jumped off the balcony. He said that he had never had suicidal thoughts, denied any intention of committing suicide, but he felt like there was this urge and this darkness that was going to compel him to jump off the balcony. We also had several users who would report overdose, um, blacking out, seizures, and vomiting. A lot of times, I'm sorry, I think I cut out there for a minute. Um, in terms of the vomiting, they'll talk about having kind of a black, ashy mucus as well, um, and they'll say that it's like they're coughing up chunks of things at times. Um, in addition, if you do any type of internet search, Google search, um, whether it's a chat line um, or anything like that about K2 or synthetics, you'll see a lot of reports of all of these hallucinations, the paranoia, all of those types of symptoms as well as chest pain. Um, we also had a couple of interesting comments from individuals talking about a sensation that they really just kind of described that they had been kind of paralyzed in the moment. So I'm going to give two examples of that. One was an individual who said that he felt as though his whole body had shut down. He knew he was alive, but until he put his hand in front of his nose, he couldn't tell if he was breathing anymore. So consciously, he would have known he was alive. He would have known he was alert. What he said is he felt like his heart was going to explode. And he stated that he took his cell phone out, dialed 9-1, was going to wait 60 seconds before hitting the other one. And we said, what would have happened if you wouldn't have made it through that 60 seconds? And he said he didn't know. Luckily, he said within that time frame, and of course being high, I'm sure his time frame was distorted, but within that time frame, it did start to slow down. Um, but basically, he just said, I didn't know I was breathing. I couldn't tell until I had the evidence in front of me and I could feel the air movement on my hand. Um, we also had an example of a client who had reported that he was sitting down to eat lunch and he had made a sandwich for himself. He sat down at the table and he said his mom just kept looking at him. And she said, what's wrong? And he had no idea kind of how to eat the sandwich. It was like he just kind of blanked out and he couldn't move his hands, he couldn't move his body. Once his mother provided step-by-step -step instructions saying, you need to pick it up, you need to put your hands around the sandwich, put it in your mouth, now chew, he was able to do that. Um, but in the interim, while he was high, he just said basically he felt paralyzed, almost as though his mind and body were both paralyzed and he could not act. Okay, so one of the new things that we're looking at is long-term effects. So we've had a couple of cases um, of the K2 clients who have reported longer-term use now. Um, reported use for over a year or chronic use um, in terms of how long they've been doing it, how frequently they're doing it. And the research is really just now starting to show some of these things. Um, if you go to scholarly journals and look up these types of articles, you're not going to find very much. Um, so again, a lot of ours is anecdotal as well, and it'll be interesting to see how the research does continue to play out in terms of scholarly journals. 
So one of the things that they are looking at is the role of, of psychosis in terms of the synthetic drugs. Um, a lot of clients who previously were not psychotic do report the um, kind of a psychotic break, um, events that happen either while they're high or what's interesting about the synthetic drugs is a lot of the symptoms seem to be residual and they tend to still be there once the client has stopped using. Um, we actually had a client who had not used in six months who stated that he was still having some lingering effects that had never been present prior to his use of case 2 or synthetic substances. Um, there's also been some suggestion that if somebody has a predisposition for a psychotic disorder or family history or if they're especially vulnerable, that using this could exacerbate that situation um, or that mental health condition. So obviously those would be concerns. Again, something that's new um, in terms of updates and what's been reported, again, you can do internet searches on this, you can talk to um, caseloads, you can talk to clients, patients about this, and there's a lot of similarities. And what we're seeing is that those um, individuals who have not used for a period of time report panic and anxiety. One of the common things that they're doing is saying that panic and anxiety are related to their inability to get the substance. Um, again, with it now being illegal to purchase and sell these items, it is a little bit more difficult to obtain, but we all know if an addict wants a drug, they're going to be able to find it somewhere. Um, so the panic and anxiety sets in because they're not high, they don't have it in hand, and then they start to sweat, they'll experience chills, and a lot of times they'll say that they can't regulate their body temperature, um, and so they feel very hot frequently. In addition to that, after that initial 24 hours, some reports of nightmares, um, disruption in thought processes, they're just saying the mind goes blank. They'll be doing something and all they can think about is getting or obtaining the drug. Um, in addition to that, we've had, again, reports of aggression when people are coming off of it because um, they just can't function. That's all they can think about is how to get it again. Um, throwing up, which can result in dehydration, the psychosis. There's been a lot of reports of chest discomfort. Um, again, most often these substances are smoked, but not always. And a lot of it seems to be that potentially the additional chemicals in these drugs um, could have impact on the lung and the chest as well. What is common amongst all of these, again, is the withdrawal period is typically 7 to 10 days. Um, so these can obviously be life-threatening reactions that individuals can have when they're using the substances, but then there's also severely adverse reactions that can come with the withdrawal. Um, one of the things I'd like to point out is that in looking at that withdrawal period, some clients have, on different chat lines, tried to suggest a taper, and so they may anecdotally get assistance from their peers in terms of how to taper off of the substance. Um, there's not obviously a medical protocol for that or anything like that. Um, one of the case examples I'd like to discuss, it was a chronic user, a young male in his early 20s who had used um, about six days a week for a period of up to a year, said that when going through withdrawal, everything was like a dream. He said, it was as if I'd blown my head off, I would still wake up from that. Um, fortunately, he did not blow his head off, but there have been several reports of successful suicide from individuals ha who have used this. Okay? All right. So, so far it looks like we're doing okay in terms of our time. Um, I just want to make sure that we stay on track with that as well because we do have a lot of information. So again, why the sudden popularity? Well, it's not so much that this became um, popular overnight. Basically, what we have is first reported use of the synthetic K2 substances was in 2009 in the United States. The explosion really started in early 2010, and then what they started doing was tracking the synthetic use among adolescents in 2011 and 2012. Um, with adolescent populations, one of the things that you see there is about 11.4 to 11.3 percent, depending on the year, stated that they had used 5K2 as synthetic marijuana within the last year. Um, that's in comparison to 2012, 36.4% reported marijuana use. Um, so it's been pretty stable between 2011 and 2012. Um, it is more common amongst males and then females, and um, that's not all that surprising because that would also hold true for marijuana use. 
As we've gone through, um, we saw a significant admission in synthetic substance use in the fall of 2011 for admissions. And again, I think part of that had to do with it was becoming more notable. There was a lot of public media uh, news articles, uh, news presentations about it because it was new and people weren't sure what was going on with the side effects. It was very scary. Um, and I think, again, Illinois legislature as well as the media as well as um, treatment agencies such as Gateway did a great job trying to educate the public in terms of the risk um, because it is so much more lethal and risky than traditional marijuana. Um, so early evidence showed that there was potential for um, tolerance as well as addiction. You do start to see the withdrawal symptoms. You do see people who um, will meet typical uh, criteria for an addiction with K2 and synthetic use. We still have a lot of individuals who are admitting um, with frequent use of K2 or synthetic drugs. Um, however, it's not as much as the primary substance as it had been briefly there in the fall of 2011. Um, it's also very common to be used with other substances. Um, just anecdotally here at the Springfield site, I cannot recall anyone who's come in with only a K2 or synthetic drug use. Um, again, like I said, a lot of people reported that they started using it because it was legal. They started using it to avoid uh, urine drug screen drops that would have been positive for a substance. Um, so they thought it was harmless. Uh, again, one of the things that we saw was individuals who would state that when they first started using it, they thought it was going to be like marijuana and they quickly realized it wasn't. Some of those individuals became so scared um, about the impact on their body and what they witnessed in their friends, they said they would never touch it again. Whereas others said, you know, it wasn't that bad, um, it scared me, but it was such, a, a, such an arousing high and such a limitless high that they really felt like it was worth continuing. Um, so in looking at the poison control centers, they had a lot of information available um, in terms of the calls that they got about uh, synthetic substances. As you can see, in the last year, 2012, they reported 5,202 exposures. Um, they had responded to more than 400 callers with questions about synthetic marijuana. So again, with public education, with understanding what is this, what are we doing here, and trying to keep track of it, um, I think that basically the Poison Control Center, the media has done a really good job on educating people, and it shows that it's stable but declining somewhat in terms of the poison control. Okay. So recently in the news, um, if those of you who are football fans, anybody football fans out there, if you could raise your hand, we can see how many football fans we have. We have a couple. All right. So college football, if you've been watching the media, if you kind of check up on that, Auburn College has been having some reports come out just in the last week um, questioning, again, whether or not their football team back in 2010 when they won the championship, whether or not those individuals were using synthetic substances. One of the things that we saw is um, reports that over a seven-week period, I think it was their tailback, had failed seven tests consecutively. Um, Auburn has adamantly denied these reports, stating that as soon as um, testing was available for synthetic substances, they implemented that as part of their procedures, um, whereas reports from both the athletes and some of the family members say no, there were um, sports and athletes who were using at that time. Something else that pops up periodically in the news has to do with the United States military. Obviously, they do um, drug testing. They have um, strong restrictions in terms of substance use and abuse and have um, very much uh, basically worked on their substance abuse program to be able to um, help active duty military members as well as retired um, or inactive members who may be coping with this. Um, obviously, there's a lot of reports about PTSD in the military. Um, so there's been some reports about synthetic use in the military and what are they doing to address that. So they're looking at their policies and procedures in terms of your analysis testing um, for these types of substances too, um, and they have policies on that as well. Okay. All right, so we are going to switch over to bath salts here for just a little bit, and then we'll talk about some of the treatment approaches and that sort of thing. Um, so bath salts are very different from synthetic marijuana. Um, it's not a, something you use in the bathtub. I know initially when we started hearing about bath salts at the site about a year and a half, two years ago now, um, people were kind of like, what's a bath salt? What's it look like? What's, 
what is all of this? Um, it's an amphetamine-based chemical um, that has similar effects to methamphetamine, ecstasy, and cocaine. Um, so in small doses, theoretically, the person would experience some euphoria. They would experience some level of um, just kind of restlessness, and, but then have some increased energy as well. Well, what they find is that individuals who report using bath salts have a very different reaction than a mild euphoria. Um, so before we get into that, one of the things I'd like to do is open up another audience poll just to get a basic level of knowledge for how bath salts may be taken. Um, if you can respond, either taken orally, snorted, injected, smoked, or all of the above, how do you think bath salts are used? Okay, so orally snorted, smoked, and all of the above seem to be the big winners. Okay, all right, the correct answer is all of the above. So bath salts may be taken orally. They can be snorted, injected, smoked, um, any of those methods. Now, frequently people do use them orally. I think the injection is probably less, um, less frequently the desired method, but it does happen. Um, and just as with any other substance, I'm sure that people have tried any combination of things um, in order to get the high. So as I was mentioning, with bath salts, in terms of a mild euphoria, that's not really what's occurring. What's happening is people are feeling very anxious, they're feeling very jittery, um, reports that they cannot sleep for days, um, they don't eat, they become severely paranoid. But probably of more concern is the erratic behavior that comes across. Um, people become hallucinate, they, sorry, they begin to hallucinate. There's been some very violent and self-mutilating acts that have occurred with this, including suicide. Um, so this is a very extreme and very dangerous drug. Uh, lots of people report that even after just one or two uses of the substance that it's been several days before they can come off of it. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit further in depth in just a moment. Um, so again, one of the other differences between bath salts and the synthetic marijuana is how long the high lasts. And I didn't really touch on this with the synthetic marijuana, but it typically is brief, um, reported up to about 60 minutes. Um, and of course, again, that varies depending on what type of substance you're using. Um, whereas the bath salts, the high is frequently reported to last about six to eight hours. So like cocaine, they report some euphoria, um, but then they get the paranoia, the depression, and they crash, and then they have the intense craving for more. Bath salts can be addictive as well, and as I mentioned, the paranoia, the hallucinations, and suicidal thoughts are very concerning. Um, people act on these very violently. We had an individual who was brought to our facility for admission who was high on bath salts at the time he arrived. When he walked in the door, he was flailing, um, arms just flailing all over the place. We asked, how did he get there? His mom had driven him, um, and we were all kind of amazed that she was able to make it to the site um, because he was so volatile and his physical movements were so erratic that it really jeopardized both of them to be in the vehicle. Um, what we would have advised had we had a caller like that on the phone would have been to call 911 for an ambulance to come transport that individual. Um, so they were very lucky to have gotten here safely without having an accident on the way or having him jump out of the vehicle even. Um, that individual actually got referred to a detoxification facility where it took him about 10 days before he was discharged. Um, there are some very serious side effects associated with bath salts, including like the kidney failure, blood circulation, um, the heart rate, the temperature, all of these things that basically the body can't withstand those in certain individuals. Um, some individuals would have the potential, as with other drugs, to die after a first time use. Basically the organs can just not withstand the impact. The heart can't withstand that much pressure all at once. Um, kidneys can shut down. The body is just not meant to respond and to have that type of physical change that abruptly and to be able to maintain that sort of thing. Um, so again, bath salts, very dangerous chemical, um, again, illegal within um, the United States, um, but it, it's available. Um, several different types of bath salts are out there as well. Some of the ones that we typically hear about are the ivory wave, which was one of the very first ones that was really kind of popular in the United States. Vanilla Sky, Cloud 9, 
Um, the cost of the bath salts typically is anywhere from about $15 to $50 per package, um, probably a little bit more currently because of the legal issue with it. Um, as things become illegal and harder to get, uh, the prices tend to go up. Um, so again, so where do people get bath salts? A lot of it, again, comes from overseas markets, um, tobacco shops, novelty stores, truck stops. Um, the Attorney General's office in Illinois actually did some major raids on different places to try to shut down, to try to pull those things off the market. Their major concern um, was not so much with the individual distributor at the market, at the truck stop, um, that sort of thing, but really going back to the manufacturer and the overall distributors because we have to get back to where can we pull it from and then we'll go from there. So a lot of truck shop stops, um, a lot of gas stations, those types of places did kind of volunteer to pull it off the market, have those items confiscated. Um, but again, looking at the big picture, who is selling these things, where are they getting into the country from, and that sort of thing. One of the things that is common about both the bath salts and the K2 or other synthetic marijuanas is that they're typically marketed as natural safe, but not for human consumption. Um, initially, people felt like by putting that not for human consumption label on everything that it would keep them out of legal trouble because they weren't trying to sell it for that purpose. Um, but in 2012, in July, the federal law did ban um, any of those synthetic substances or anything that could be produced, possessed, or ingested um, here in the United States. So that was a huge win um, for proponents of sobriety, proponents of having a healthier lifestyle. Um, and for the legal um, teams, families who support their kids being able to make it another day. Um, so that was a huge change there back in 2012. Um, in addition to that, one of the things that comes up with a concern for a lot of these synthetic things, as I mentioned, they're not regulated. So there is a lot of concern about what other chemicals are being placed in here. Um, we've had reports of people who thought that this spray chemical had been done like in a bathtub. Well, they don't know if the bathtub's been cleaned with bleach. They don't know if the bathtub had other substances in it, other drugs. So you never know what's being put in combination, which is sometimes what um, leads to the unpredictability of the high because it's not a stable manufactured type of substance. Um, some clients like that. Some patients are very much um, into the unpredictability and they don't know what they're going to get. Unfortunately, sometimes that leads to death. Um, what we saw, again, in the fall of 2011, we saw a huge number of clients coming in, mostly adolescent males or younger males in their 20 to 25 age group, who were coming in reporting um, either the bath salts or the K2. We did have more K2 and synthetic marijuana than bath salts, but there was some of both. So one of the things that we did is we gathered as much information from those groups as we could in terms of what they were experiencing, what were their withdrawal symptoms. We worked with our medical team as well as the families through family therapy to try to make sure that we had a stable environment, the support of everyone involved, and that we could keep these individuals medically stable as well as address their risk for relapse. Um, again, back then it was so much more accessible, um, although we get reports that it's back on the shelves at some of the local head shops and that sort of thing here. Um, but we really had to put a lot of emphasis on finding out what we were dealing with because each client is different, each person's needs are different, and providing them with the same treatment is not the best response. So we tried to tailor the treatment to what they needed. Um, and again, what we're seeing is some of that tapering. We're finding more individuals who are coming in with, yes, I've used it, or I use it when I can't find anything else. Um, but not as much people coming in with that as their primary substance. Um, so I think the initial wave of it's something new, it's something safe, um, it's something that you can't be tested for, some of that is wearing off a little bit. But I also think, as I mentioned, the public education of it's not safe, you can die, has also related in people educating each other again on how to use it. So we're seeing more adolescents who are reporting that they know not to use as much as they were of marijuana or to hold off on it a little bit. So looking at the American Poison Control Centers um, as far as bath salts, in 2011 they had 6,138 calls for exposure, but for the entire year of 2012 that dropped down to 2,654. So that's a significant drop in calls. Again, I think some of it comes from now people know what they're using. Um, 
family members aren't calling poison control going, oh my gosh, they're doing this and I don't know what happened. Now they're taking the people to the emergency room and saying, we know they're using bath salts or we know they're using this substance. Um, so people are getting more educated. So the initial, oh my goodness, what are these symptoms? They're seizing, they're having this thing. We don't know what they took. There's more education there so they understand now this is what they did. Here we go again is one of the things that we hear sometimes. Um, from family members is that concern of we've been through this, they almost died, they were in the hospital, they were in ICU for almost two weeks, they came home and here's this again, they need help. So the drops in calls, I don't necessarily equate that to a drop in use, but again to the education, but that would be anecdotal, I don't have research to support that. So as I was mentioning, in July of 2012, the federal ban was enacted. It covers both online and interstate sale of bath salts and other synthetics. Um, so that's a huge win for the federal government, for law enforcement agencies, for families, for treatment providers. This law closed the loopholes that had allowed manufacturers to circumvent local and state bans because initially there were a lot of local villages um, who were really trying to say, you can't buy this in this area, or here's the fine. But those people were just having to pay fines to that village. State laws obviously take a little bit longer to enact sometimes, um, but even at the state level it happened. Federal law finally came into place um, almost a year ago now. And what it did is, again, it prohibits any other synthetics that may have different chemical formulas but produce the same effect. That was that loophole that they got around. By changing one chemical component, the law no longer applied. So instead of selling K2 that was illegal, they could sell K9 because instead of JWH18, it may have had JWH47 as the active chemical. This law changed it to where it doesn't make any difference if you change one or two chemicals, if it's the same purpose and it produces the same effect, it's still illegal. Um, here's a, just a little bit more information about the law itself, um, talking about the active ingredients in those different chemicals um, through the FDA. So again, it cannot be sold, it cannot be prescribed for any medical purposes. It talks about the different compounds that are in there, um, and it talks about all of those different things that experts have said they need to slow down the movement. Um, again, some of it's resurfacing in previous gas stations, um, head shops where they had not been sold um, due to the law changing. Some are coming back up, but again, you look at that market value of up to $12,000 a day, Again, that would be the extreme amount, but even for somebody making $2,000 a day or $4,000 a day, there is a lot of incentive to keep selling it for those individuals. So one of the things that a lot of our audience wanted to talk about is, so what do we do with these individuals? How do we provide treatment? What can we do if they come in in crisis? Um, so we'll spend this next um, 10 to 15 minutes here talking about treatment options and how to evaluate and that sort of thing, and then we'll close out for questions. The first thing is, with all of the symptoms that can be present, the extreme risk involved in those symptoms, the first thing that has to be done in any of these situations is, is medical stabilization. Um, so I want to start by saying I am not a medical doctor. I am a clinical psychologist. I do not have medical training um, that would allow me to say here is a, um, here is a prescription that you need to give this individual. I don't have training that would suggest here is how you do this. What I can tell you is common things that are being done, um, but of course anybody who would be treated for this needs to be treated in a medical facility or under medical care and medical guidance. Um, they need to be monitored consistently. So with that, um, as I mentioned the vomiting, so obviously one of the things that is used oftentimes in a hospital setting are IV fluids. They try to keep the individual hydrated. Um, sometimes intubation is needed because of the respiratory assistance, the, um, the lungs, the chest, the body just can't withhold and respond appropriately. So sometimes that has to happen. And part of that is because in part, again, I'm not a medical doctor, but a lot of times uh, benzodiazepines are used to address the severe agitation um, when individuals come in. They also sometimes use it for sedation purposes um, to try to prevent a seizure because seizures are very common with both bath salts and with some of the synthetic substances. Um, so again, a medical doctor, a facility such as a hospital, someone with medical care in an outpatient office would have to make an assessment of that individual, look at other medications they're prescribed, reactions, determine what the risk is, what the benefit would be. Um, but a lot of times they are looking at 
IV fluids. They're looking at benzodiazepines um, to assist. And again, that oftentimes results, especially with bath salts, in somebody being in an ICU for anywhere from five to 10 days. Um, with the K2 and, and the synthetic substances, I've not heard of somebody being in an ICU um, for any extended period of time. Um, but again, monitoring them, making sure their vitals are stable, making sure that their blood pressure remains stable, that their temperature um, is within normal limits. Those are all things that would be critical. Um, hyperthermia can occur in these situations. So again, the first thing to do would be to get them somewhere where we can be monitoring them for medical stability. Um, calling 911 for the family members, getting an ambulance there as quickly as possible. Now, if someone is actively high, that's probably what you're going to do. If they're coming through a withdrawal period, they may still present in an office setting or an outpatient setting or may present for an assessment. Um, given that, we have had clients who we ask, when's the last time you used, yesterday morning or last night? Um, so what we want to do is kind of a timely and effective screening. We want to find out what all are they using. We want to look for, are there reactions that we might anticipate um, between other drugs or other substances? We might anticipate asking them, what's the, um, what's the longest you've gone without this substance? When you went that long, what happened? Because if they have a history of seizures without using it in 24 hours, we need to know that. We need to be alert to that. Um, if they've never had a seizure when coming off of it, that's a good thing, but we're still going to monitor just to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, if they do have a history of seizures, blacking out, um, severe agitation, we may want to go ahead and try to get them to a hospital setting. Um, but as many of you providers may know, a lot of detox facilities as well as hospitals cannot always accept people if they don't have symptoms present at that moment. Um, so you want to do a timely and effective screening. You want to get a good history. Um, and that would just be your basic ethical standard right there. Start with the screening. Start with the information. Get a good history on what's going on. If the individual is not reliable, it's always good to get collateral information, um, whether it be from the parents, from the boyfriend, the girlfriend, anybody who might be able to help. Um, because as we all know, a lot of times clients are not good, um, good historians of their own use. In addition to that, there's drug testing. Um, this typically comes up as a big question when these presentations go on. Um, people have heard lots of different things. It doesn't show up on a drug test. It does show up, different things like that. So what's really going on with the drug test for K2 and bath salts? So the short answer is this. It can be tested for. However, typically not on a standard test. Um, some of the K2 tests being marketed, you can go on online, you can Google it, you can look at Amazon probably even. But if you just look at Google.com, you put in um, drug testing for K2, synthetic marijuana, whatever, you can find a place that will sell you online a package of five um, urine dipsticks for probably $20. One of the problems with some of those tests is that they're only testing for one chemical compound that is typically associated with the synthetic drugs. Um, so you have to be very cautious. You have to read the disclaimers. You have to find out, you know, is it only testing for JWH18? If so, there's a lot of other synthetic drugs that could be being used, and it would still show up as negative. Um, so what I can best advise is that you have to talk to your, inventory, your individual laboratories to find out what are they testing for. Um, I know that what we have here at Gateway Foundation is we have a typical six panel test. We also have 12 panel tests. We also have the availability to send the urine off to a laboratory for testing. Um, with that, we can have it tested for K2 and they will test it for a variety of chemical compounds. Um, so again, if you work in an agency or facility that has your own lab, you can test for it. Um, if you don't do that, just a regular dipstick or a regular K2 test may not because it may only be testing for one or two of those chemical components and you may have somebody using something that's not included in there. Um, so you can test for it, but you're going to have to really talk to your laboratory, talk to um, who's ever over your testing to find out what exactly is being tested for. Um, they have come a long way with this, and you know hospitals can test for it as well. Um, but again, it's very individual, so there's not a blanket yes or no every test. It depends on the type of test and who you're using. So treatment options for this, um, again, you want to look at working with the individual with where they are, with what their circumstances, what they've used, looking at their history. Um, 
basic substance abuse treatment, we use both individual and group psychotherapy. Um, cognitive behavioral therapies have been found to be very effective. Research is done frequently on cognitive behavioral therapy, and it almost always comes up as evidence-based. Um, family therapy, motivational interviewing, and motivational enhancement therapies um, are all very effective. One of the key components, again, with that family therapy is finding out what's going on in the home environment, what's going on in terms of use with other members, with other individuals, um, working with probation. If your individual that you're serving has um, probation mandates, you want to talk to the probation person and find out, you know, what have they been using, what are they doing to skirt around this, um, talking to them and educating them as far as the risk. Um, when we're doing all of these things, whether it's family therapy, individual, or group, one of the things we're looking to do is increase the protective factors. So when we talk about protective factors, we want to talk about self-control. We want to talk about parent support or spousal support if we're talking about adults. Supervision, self-esteem, education, access to health care, and coping skills. Um, individuals don't frequently use because they think it's a healthy alternative and because life's going great. Um, if you could, just raise your hand if you've ever had somebody report to your office who says, I'm highly functional, my life is perfect, and I'm only using because I'm bored and I have nothing else to do. Okay. All right. I was hoping a couple people would raise their hand, and we do have a few who have. Um, one of the reasons, because we get that, we get people who come in the door and say, my life's great. I'm married. My wife loves me. I've got a great job. Um, they say that everything is just going perfect, and I'm bored, and I feel like I deserve it. I feel like it was something different, or I went out with the guys one night, and they tried it, and now I've got to have it. Um, that can happen with some individuals where they get started that way, but they still have issues they need to work on in terms of their inability to stop, if it's causing problems in their marriage, if it's causing problems for them at work. Um, but most of the clients who we're presenting or who are presenting to us have some sort of deficit within some of their protective factors. There's things going on in their life that are not allowing or enabling them to be fully successful without the use of drugs. And a lot of times they don't realize that the drugs are playing a role in that. Um, so again, getting the history. What was going on before your drug use? What's gone on since you've used? What are the periods of time you've gone without? What happened in that? What was your motivation in terms of times that you decided to quit using? Um, and then what led you to relapse? Um, another important thing there is the idea of relapse. Some people think if they go a week without using, then they relapse. Well, really, they just went a week without using. Um, they weren't sober in there. They weren't focused on living a recovery-oriented lifestyle. Um, and so they just didn't use for a week. Um, in order to relapse, they really had to have a grasp on what they were doing and really trying to make sure that they were trying to live that sober lifestyle um, or that recovery-oriented lifestyle or to make a choice just to not have drugs in their life anymore. Um, so often we hear, well, I just didn't have it for three days and then I relapsed. Well, just because you didn't have accessibility to it, that's not really a relapse. But at the same time, I'm not going to argue with a client over whether or not it's a relapse. I'm going to talk to them about, that was great, for three days you went. Let's see if we can make that time longer. Let's see if we can um, reduce your risk, and let's see if we can have something to be successful here with. So we use all of these um, different treatment options here at Gateway. Um, again, working with the client, where they're at, what's their motivation, what are they interested in doing, looking at what's going well in their life instead of just focusing on the things that they've lost. Um, or I actually had a client the other day who came back, one of our graduates, who said, it's not that I lost my wife, my house, and my job. I gave it away. Um, I gave it away due to my substance abuse. And I thought that was so insightful, and I thought that was a great way of looking at it. But a lot of our clients aren't there yet. But as a graduate, he recognized that he didn't lose it. He gave it up. Um, so we want to look at not just what have you lost or what have you given up for your use, but we also want to take them back and look at where were you as a person before that? What were you good at? What do you enjoy doing? And how can we get you back in touch with your future goals, with your family, get you in a supportive area where you're feeling successful so that when you have a craving, when you have an urge, how are you going to cope with that and how are you going to come through that period of time? Um, all right. We also look at, in terms of overall, and try and 
uh, to look at the greater good, um, prevention education for communities, for schools, employers. Um, that's one of the things we do by trying to get the word out. We here at Gateway did a lot of effort in terms of 2011, 2012, really trying to talk to schools, trying to talk to the media, trying to get articles out about the risk of K2 because we had seen so many of our adolescents in here who had lost friends. We had a lot of our young men in here, a lot of young women who said, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, they're like a totally different person now. Um, family members who were scared. And so we really felt like it was our obligation to get out there and say, this is a very risky substance. This is a very frightening substance. We need to make sure that people understand it is not like marijuana. It is addictive. There are real risks up to and including death involved in this. So we want to make sure that we're doing prevention education, letting kids know the risk of it, um, and then also self-help groups. Um, trying to encourage people to support each other and support their peers while they're going through these substance use. Okay, um, so we've got some additional articles and resources on here. The Illinois Poison Center actually has a very good article. Um, if you put in, I think they have a search window, if you put in synthetic drugs, they have a lot of really good information. There's also a couple of different stories up here and different things that you can link on if you want more information. Because um, again, we had a lot to go over in a short amount of time, so I kind of ran through it quickly. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to Matt here for a minute. Okay, thanks Dr. T. That actually concludes the one hour training session. So if you are logging off now due to time constraints, as a courtesy to Gateway, we ask that you please take a few moments and fill out the brief survey to offer your feedback about the webinar. And also, several of you have asked about this, but be on the look uh, out for an email we will be sending in the next few days that will contain actually a link to the video recording and as, the, uh, as well the PowerPoint. So uh, keep an eye out for that email. We uh, thank you once again for attending. We're going to go over some questions right now. So uh, we'll give uh, Dr. Otini a second to, to catch up on those, and then we will cover as many as we can in the next few minutes. So bear with us for just a second here. Okay. All right, Matt, I think we can probably start going through some of the questions now for those who are going to stay on. Okay. It looks like our first question is from Cheryl, and she asks, are these substances more prevalent in rural areas? All right, um, again, there's not specific data available about what substances are being used where. Um, the poison control centers probably do track some by area code, but I've not found any research anywhere to say what is or is not. Um, I know in working with the Attorney General's office, we actually had them out here at the site several times, and I worked very closely with them. They found it all over, um, whether it was a rural community, a small gas station with a town of, say, 600, or whether it was a more um, populated area, they were finding them everywhere. Um, as of the current, again, with it being illegal, I can't speak to that, but it doesn't seem like it was isolated to rural areas. I know a lot of times people talk about, you know, methamphetamine being more of a rural drug as opposed to, um, say, like cocaine. Um, the bath salts, most of what we did here was from central Illinois, but again, our site's located more specifically in the central area. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Tanya, and she said, I have a client report that individuals are making K2 at home. Have you heard of this? We have, um, and I, I may have already answered this in the terms of the presentation, but as I mentioned, people can go online and order the chemical components from, um, like, China. And what they do is they order the spray, and then basically they could spray it on anything. Um, they could spray it on a piece of paper and smoke it if they chose to. But typically, like I said, they're using it on a dry plant. Um, and again, the risk there is where are they spraying it? Are they putting it in a plastic tote to spray it? And at that point, is it absorbing some of the chemicals in the plastic tote? Are they putting it in a bathtub um, that has maybe been cleaned with other chemicals? And there's the potential for such a reaction there and individuals not to know what they're getting. Um, so yes, some people are making it at home. Um, I don't hear a lot of that here in Illinois, specifically not in Springfield. Most of our individuals report buying the small foil packages um, but it can happen. The other thing, and I don't think that I mentioned this earlier, is that there are, um, people can buy it almost in a pill form and dump it into a smoothie, and then they'll talk about having smoothies with it in there. 
Um, so there are people who are doing that at home as well. Okay, the next question is from Krista, and she asks, how long do these substances stay in a person's system for drug testing purposes? Um, again, that one's a tricky one because it depends on which chemical substance they're using. So if they're using K2 versus K9 um, versus K10 versus, um, you know, Mad Hatter, the chemicals within those substances are different. Um, again, just like with marijuana, sometimes people use it for one time and then they get freaked out and they say, I'm never going to use it again, versus somebody who's using it five days a week. Um, so it depends on the chemical itself, um, and so there's not a great answer for that question, unfortunately. What I would, I would encourage people to do, again, is talk to your laboratory, um, ask them what their baseline is that they're measuring that for, and then try to find out is that something that's within the daily use, is that something that's within a once a week use. Um, because my understanding is that it typically does not stay in the system for a long time, but again, it would depend on each chemical. That's actually all the questions uh, that I have for right now. Do you have any additional? Um, I'm looking through this real quick. I see a couple people posting a couple things real quick. Um, as far as somebody, uh, let's see here, it looks like Ashley had asked about the possible legal consequences for manufacturing and or using. Um, the legal consequences for manufacturing of this substance I'm not sure what that is, but I think there is, um, if you look at this uh, DEA webpage or the justice.gov, there may be more information about that consequence there. Um, use of synthetic drugs can also be punished. Um, you know, if somebody, just like having a prescription, if you're caught driving um, and you get pulled over and you have benzodiazepines in your system and you're not prescribed those, you can get um, ticketed for driving under the influence. Um, synthetic drugs would be under that same area where you can get ticketed for driving under the influence. Um, or use in those same manners. Um, as far as specific fines, um, I'm not the legal expert. Um, like I said, previously Mike and Cara um, from the Attorney General's office did this with me and they would have had more information. But I would encourage you to t contact your local police department um, if you have questions about that. Unfortunately, I can't be as much of a resource on that. Um, okay. Okay. I think that's most of, uh, there's, I see there's some questions about the PowerPoints and that sort of thing. Um, so I know that those will be posted in PDF form where people can download those. Um, we do have a question on here about side effects um, for brain damage. Um, I have a student who used bath salts over the course of six months or so. He already had a learning disability, but after the drug use lost much of his ability to process language or information. He is a different person and presents like a mentally impaired student. What more can you tell us about these types of side effects? Um, again, unfortunately, there's not a lot of formal research on it. What I'd expect is to see some sort of brain scans long term um, that a medical journal would start to um, publish that sort of thing where they would have brain imaging and they would show somebody with a healthy brain, somebody who used, had used bath salts or other substances over time. Um, they just don't have that information available right now. Again, anecdotally, we are seeing people who have residual effects for quite some time. The longest we had reported in-house was six months. Um, but again, most of those people that were either treating and then getting out, um, you know, we're not following up to say, hey, a year from now, what effects are you still having? Um, and that those individuals who go out and start using again, they've not had a period of um, sobriety or time without the substance for that long that we would know that. Um, it will be very interesting to see long term and down the road what are the impacts. You know, there's a lot of research about methamphetamine and again the bath salts have an amphetamine base about what types of long term effects there are and there are long term potential damages there. Um, so that is absolutely something that we would expect to see. Um, And I think it seems like those are most of the questions um, that would be pertinent to the full audience. I know there's a couple on here that are more specific to individuals, um, and those are things we can follow up on as well. OK. 
Okay. All right. So I just want to thank everyone um, for logging in today. And I hope that we've answered your questions and given you some information about um, the K2 synthetic substances and bath salts. And again, thank you for your participation. Thank you all.